Self-Publishing Roundtable, Episode 3. Welcome to the third episode of the Self Publishing Roundtable, the weekly show that tells you everything you need to know about this week in self publishing and a whole heap of shit that you probably don't. I'm Carl Sinclair and I'm joined today by Ray Finnegan, John Ward, and Chrissy Mark. And fortunately, Bill Gauss was unable to make it. So, hello everyone, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going, guys? That good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Big talkers today. Yeah. Uh, so, we'll just start off straight off the bat, I guess, and start talking about the self-publishing podcast episode with Joe and a pen, which was number 62, Two. I think, yeah. 62. Chrissy? I don't have the notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we've started well. Yeah, uh, well, professionals. <laughs> I, we learned everything we know from Johnny B. Truant. That's right. <laughs> John, would you like to stop? Sure. Um, this episode, they talked about uh, the dangers of comparing your work to other authors. Um, they spoke a lot about um, Joanna's work and um, a new website that features the works of ver various authors working in the thriller genre um, called killer-thrillers.com. I thought that was a great idea for a website because it it collects the works of a bunch of different authors. If you go to the page, there's probably 30 to 50 authors represented there. And if you're a fan of that genre, it's it can become a great resource. And um, as someone who reads a lot of Blake Crouch and different authors who are on there, I, I was all over that page. I, I love that because there's a lot of authors that I found there that I wasn't really aware of um, before that they wrote in the thriller genre. So I think that's something that could be valuable for a bunch of self-publishing authors to get together and set up for themselves where um, you know, they build a web page based off of the genre and feature all of your work so that it becomes a one-stop shop for people as a place to locate similar works. And you can um, if you're a fan of a certain author then you know, it helps you um, identify other authors who are writing similar type stuff. So it could be a good tactic for <clears throat> self-publishers to consider. I think um, I think it would be really good for perhaps even really niche subgenres and stuff because there's so many books on Amazon and you know something might come under fantasy, but it's a sub subgenre of something. And um, yeah, if you had a website like that, someone who's searching for that subgenre might. You know, be able to find more like-minded people. You've kind of done that as well, John, haven't you? With your um, urban fantasy community on Google Plus, it's a similar, similar idea. Well, I have a community. It's not an actual web page. Um, no, <clears throat> but that's a place where you know people who are passionate about the genre of urban fantasy can go and talk to other people. We're not, we don't restrict ourselves only to books. We talk about movies and TV shows, whatever. Um, but, yeah, I've found tons of great authors um, because of that community, um, just by being able to talk to other fans. It's, it's kind of like, you know, if you were going to a convention and, um, you know, you could walk down the aisle and talk to somebody, hey, have you read this person? Have you read that person? Um, except it allows you to do that virtually. And you know that everybody in that community likes that specific genre. So I, I really I enjoy, the, enjoy it. I think it's a really good idea. I joined a couple of fantasy um, communities on Google Plus for the same reason, so I can talk fantasy books with a bunch of people on a more specific, you know, more specific way of doing it. Talking to the people I know who really love it, not just people who love all sorts of books. You know, they're my that's my favorite genre to read, and that's really why I join them. So I guess a website along those lines would be an excellent idea. What do you think, Chrissy? Um. I 
Well, I've been kind of doing that for a while. I mean, I joined um, a, a lot of art communities a long time ago that were specific for science fiction and fantasy because I love science fiction and fantasy. So it's like going to conventions. You spend time with people who are steeped in that that thing, particular thing they loved, Star Trek or Star Wars or, you know, just comic books. If you hang around people who are like, like-minded, I guess, you're likely to encounter things you love even more. So it, it makes sense. I, I think Joanna's doing a really good job, too, of, of being able to put herself in places where people can find her. Uh, that's one of the things, like, uh -huh. a couple times I've listened to her podcasts, and then when she, she's been on uh, SPP, totally, she, she puts herself out there, and so people can find her her stuff and uh, something really to, good to learn from that, I think. And we'll she's see, also, um, sorry, Kathy, go on. <laughs> she's also doing a bunch of multimedia stuff. Like she's now doing audiobooks. She did that uh, contest where she wrote the three short stories and they embedded clues inside the short stories so that they could have actually find a real prize in the world. And it's kind of interesting the way she's branching out, not just in her writing, but going out and doing um, other things throughout the world and bringing it into real life. She's, um, she's definitely very visible, isn't she? I mean, she, to, be, like, to be honest, when I first started researching and looking into self-publishing about a year and a half ago, she's the first person I came across and she was everywhere. Um, so she's definitely doing a good job of selling herself and putting herself out there. And it's working. Like all of this stuff works. So. Right. Any any way you can make yourself stand out from the crowd, right? I mean, that's kind of what I'm getting getting from her a lot. Just try different things. I, I, one of the quotes I wrote down from the SPP was, you know, basically paraphrasing here, but she didn't really know where the sales are coming from. She isn't real good necessarily at tracking them because she's been doing this now for quite some time. Or most of us are pretty new, but she's been podcasting, blogging, doing all these things, and. She, Somehow they just kind of the sales are now just you know kind of come self perpetuating. They keep ticking off, ticking off, ticking off, and um, very interesting that uh, how she puts herself out there all the time. So. John, you had something to add? Just that um, I think there's a lesson to be learned there for people who are into self publishing because so many times authors will you know they have a promotion, they're going to make their book free or what have you, and they think that that is enough to. Um, that's enough action on their part to deserve the attention of anybody who comes across the notice. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, everybody does that. I mean, you have tens of thousands of authors doing that every day, and it's not enough. You need to take that extra step, start a podcast, um, do organize some kind of collective event with other authors, or, you know, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, do what Garrett's doing with with the way he launched Realm Keepers. But create a spectacle. Do something that is unique, something that nobody else is doing, so that whenever somebody runs across that, they think, hey, that's interesting. I've never seen that before. And that's what you want to get, is the I've never seen that before response, but in a good way. You don't want to be like, <laughs> wow, I've never wow. seen that before. Uh, this person horrible. totally screwed up. <laughs> You don't want people talking about you that way, but you know. Unless you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he embraces that, right? <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good point, John. I totally agree. I pay attention to what Joanna's doing and people like what, as you said, you can talk about what Gareth's doing because it's it's different. You know, there's more than tens of thousands. There's probably hundreds of thousands of them doing exactly the same thing every day. And I'm never going to probably see those people because there's too many for me to even pay attention to. So. Yeah, and but I but also that it lends to the same topic they had too about comparing to other authors. I thought it was a very interesting conversation they had about the way Sean and John, Johnny and Dave are doing it, and the way Joanna's doing it. Joanna, to me, is more traditional in the sense that she's publishing full-length books at a spaced-out time. But she's found a way to make it work. It's like her and C.J. Lyons or something like that. Or it is, you know, the serialized fiction with the SPP guys, it, it still works. It just works differently. And, I, you know, I, 
I made a connection when I watched that episode because it was like I can't, I don't want I want to copy some things some things that they maybe they do but I don't want to copy them I want to be my own person be my own author do my own things whatever feels right whatever how, however you you want to say it um, and then run with it and and that's what I get from both of those camps is you got to take something and run with it and see what happens. Well, something to keep in mind, too, is what they were doing a year ago isn't working for them anymore. They're, they're switching it up, and they're, they're adjusting and experimenting. They, nobody knows where sales come from. They, they just they try the new things, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It, we, and following somebody else's habits isn't going to guarantee the next person does anything. I mean, traditional publishers have been having the same problem forever. They will publish something and it will take off and then they'll try to duplicate the same thing and it won't. It just won't go anywhere. So they try something else and it, you just can't guarantee anything because you're basically trying to sell a, a product that people will like it one day and not the next. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? I am. Um, I did that a lot. I compare myself to, to those guys when I first started watching and, you know, I have to write this many words a day and I have to, you know, do this and that. And not necessarily to copy their model or anything, but just was constantly comparing myself. But, you know, in the last two or three months, I, you know, took it the other way and I've just gone, no, I'm going to be my own person. I'm going to build my own, um, my own release schedule. I'm going to do things the way I want to do them. And I'm, I've, felt much happier about what I'm doing since I've been working that way. I mean, I'm obviously taking ideas from people who have been successful in different ways, but I'm adapting them to who I am and what time I have to do things and how I want to, you know, put myself out there. So I think um, comparing yourself can be a bad thing most of the time, I think. I, everyone's different, everyone's unique, and I think that's a good thing. I think. You know, I'd rather be my own person than, uh, you know, trying to copy someone else who's been successful for the very reason what Chrissy just said, because it might not work. And, you know, and just because they like one thing the same and they're not going to necessarily like the other, and people change their minds constantly about what they like, so. Yeah, and what you're talking about there, Carl, just sounds like what good business people do, right? I mean, they, they take ideas and things from other businesses, but they mold it, adapt it, Make it their own to work for them, um, and however they want to run their business. So, and that's what we are. We're our own business. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's really good way to way to put it. The important thing that you have to do, and that a lot of people will forget to do, is to keep good records. Um, document what type of promotional activities you engage in, when you started it, how long you ran, where you run those ads, or whatever you're doing keep good records, and then document the results. Continue to do that for six months, then you can compare, you know, which what, which methods are the most successful for you as an, as an individual. Because you're going to reach people that Sean and Johnny or Joanna or whoever can't reach, and they're going to reach people that you can't reach, because they're um, sending their message out into different venues than you are. And so they're speaking to different people just like you're speaking to different people. And what you want to figure out is how you can reach the people that are listening to you. And that's the, you, you won't be able to find that information unless you're keeping records. Because those records will let you go back and say, oh, that, that worked. You know, whenever I posted messages on this site, then I got a good response. So my crowd, the people who like my books, live there. I'm going to spend more time there. That's what you need to, what every self-publisher needs to consider doing. It sounds like you're prescribing to someone to be very organized, John, which unfortunately I'm not. <laughs> but organization probably is the key to running a business or self-publishing or just about anything. But a, um, a friend of mine, Melissa Pearl, she's a um, self-published author. She's got a bunch of young adult fantasy and paranormal and romance books out, and she's very good at um, keeping a track of everything that she keeps a track of anyone who's she's got big spreadsheets and databases of everyone who's ever posted a review on her stuff um, you know different review sites that she's used that have 
you know, been favourable and haven't been and on certain types of books and she's very good at her releases of new stuff because she knows exactly, well, she has a very strong idea of where her fan base might be based on what she, the data she's collected and she can target those people again um, well in advance with different promotions and stuff to get them ready or behind her book when it comes out and quite often um, she's just released um, a, a, a young adult fantasy trilogy, the first book of that's coming out. She's written all three of them at once. They're coming out a month apart. And the first book came out, and the day it came out, she had over 20 reviews up, posted, and ready because they were, you know, she was so organized and she targeted those you know, group of fans. Um, so she gets herself some visibility straight away, um, and she's very good at doing that. Yeah. It's good advice. <laughs> okay, do we want to talk about the um, the audiobook stuff that Joanna um, was talking about a little bit, or does anyone have anything to add on that? We kind of did last week. Yeah, we did. Yeah, there's not much really to add, is there? Um, has anyone got anything else on self-publishing podcasts, or should we just move on to the storytelling podcast episode? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good there was the... The Better Off and Dead, which was a, like the second episode of um, the SPP, where they talked about the best ways to read and publish um, serials. Do we want to talk about that? Uh, we can, but it's been over a week and a half since I watched that one now, so my head's not working right this one. Um, did you want to? <laughs> was there something you wanted to add about that, Chrissy? Uh, well. I just thought it was interesting how they were they were discussing um, the the ninety nine cent books and somebody had asked them whether bundling cannibalized sales and they they pretty much said no not really because you're you're balancing the ninety nine cents for which you get thirty percent royalties off of the adult, the two ninety nine which you get seventy percent royalties and, yeah right yeah. <clears throat> And they've, they've, tried, they've tried it a couple of ways, haven't they? They first would release mm -hmm. an episode a week and then the full season would come out and I think they found that the full seasons were where they were making their money and then they did the... But they were still making some money at the beginning on the episodes and they were building some visibility, but then when they moved to the model, the Netflix model of um, releasing the first episode and the first season at the same time, they saw a massive um, disappearance of episode sales, they were still getting the, the full season sales, which was good money-wise, but they probably lost a bit of visibility because those six weeks of being in the, the charts with the individual episodes kind of disappeared. Yeah. That's why I took from it. Yeah, and, and the, the, whole, the whole pricing thing, I think we could actually, uh, some a later date, may just do a whole topic thing on pricing because Amazon's got us by the short and curlies kind of because they, they make you know, the decisions there on the royalties, which then drives how we price everything here on out. And actually, some of the emails we had this week, or last today even, were a little bit about pricing and whether or not 99 cents comes off as looking cheap, per se, or, you know, those sort of things. And um, I think that it's an interesting topic. I don't know if we would totally dive into it now, but it, uh, I, I, that's what I enjoyed the most out of the Better Off and Dead. There was a the whole idea... And 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 the, them talking about being good to their readers, which is something that they've talked about lots. You know, we don't want we, readers should come first, and I totally agree. Um, but also, they got to balance that with trying to make a living. You know, I don't think any of us right now are dependent on any sales of books to be able to make the electric bill. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, to trying me, to that, get there. <laughs> trying to get there, right? That's the idea, right? So that to me puts a whole different spin on it, uh, too. So that we could, you know, you could talk a lot about that too when it comes to pricing and maximizing sales and or putting things on sale. But I, I did like. The discussion about you know bundling versus single episodes. I, and you know what? I, I should probably know this, but I don't know. Is any anybody in the group writing serials right now? Anybody writing a serial? Not exactly. My my small bites. They are four books that will go together into one larger book. So the serial, the individuals are each ninety nine cents, and the one large one is going to be two ninety nine. And then once I have that out next week, I'll actually 
have one out for free. So uh, um, it's sorry, Christy. not exactly the same thing because it's short stories instead of, or you know, individual short stories instead of um, an ongoing story, but it's the same concept. Okay. I, um, I have written a serial which is completed and just being final, in its final editing stage now, and that will be coming out later this month. Um, the reason I did that was because the story that I wanted to tell, I couldn't get it to work. I tried it in different formats. I tried it as a longer book, as a novel. I tried it as um, uh, a couple of series of short stories. I tried it as um, I tried it as a novella uh, trilogy. It just wasn't working. And then when I came across um, those guys and what they were doing with serialized fiction, then I started reading some other serials from the Kindle Serial program. Um, I thought maybe trying it, it that way and when I when I plotted it out and I did it in the episode way and I based it off of like the TV model it clicked straight away and I wrote the whole 70,000 words in a couple of weeks. Um, nice. So um, that that particular project was specifically because I wanted to tell that story and I couldn't find another way to, to make it work for me so I don't know how that's going to work. I'm working on several different ways of putting stuff out, but that, that particular science fiction, or science fantasy, I'm calling it, um, it, uh, is a serial, so yes, I am. So I am kind of interested, I guess, to see how they do things and how this is working at the moment. Okay, well, should we, should we talk a little bit about STP then and about what they're, well, what Garrett and Zach just did with their book a little bit, even though we touched on it last week, because that actually fits and then we can also and talk about the fact about, that I won. <laughs> yes, we should talk about that. You beat Carl's ass, which is very, very important. <laughs> I cheated, though. Cheated. Cheated. He, he says I don't count because I cheated. If you're yeah, not trying, if you're not cheating, you're not trying hard enough, Chrissy. That's that's, that's right. what I was like. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll just talk about the release first, and then we'll move on to the subject. So they finally released Realm Keepers, which. Uh, is their new young adult fantasy series, which is kind of a serial, um, but it's going to be done in books as well. Uh, it comes out as a single book. Now they went um, with what John was talking about earlier on, of trying to get noticed and doing something different that I haven't actually seen any other um, indie author do yet. They're the first ones that I can remember doing it, where they've pre put a pre-order up of their um, print edition, which generally, from what I understand and from what I've heard, doesn't necessarily do that well for self-published authors, and by doing that and pre-ordering that book, um, they will give you all of the eBooks for free and send them out as they come out in episodes leading up to the release of the paperback. They've also given an additional free um, short story set in the world, which is only available for the pre-ordered uh, pre authors, and the paperback will be signed and numbered based on when you pre-ordered it, which is pretty cool for me as well. And Chrissy cheated. <laughs> <laughs> I got number three behind Bilbo, Dallas, and Chrissy. Bilbo. Yeah. Bilbo. I got number 11. Actually, I got a shout-out today from Garrett. See, so I'm in, I was in this, not in the top 10, but that's okay. I don't mind that. But I thought this, you know, the more I thought about this, the more I thought this is pretty darn smart. Because one thing about it, too, and actually – David Wright mentioned this in the last episode of SPP too. When you, he, you know, he was talking about that you want your readers to know when you get a when you get a downloaded book, right? So if you do an e-reader like on a Kindle, you if you do pre-orders, it might get popped into your Kindle reader at any time, and you might look over it, be reading something else. You wouldn't be necessarily waiting for it. And I, what I liked about Garrett's model as I'm getting the the e-books, but they're going right to my email which is different, and so now I got, oh, here it is, okay, and I automatically did the lemming thing, clicked on it, downloaded it right there, and started reading page one off of my iPhone. So I thought, gosh, they, they got me hook, line, and sinker, and that's exactly what they, were, what they were probably looking for. And the bonus they've got as well, obviously they're going to sell some print books, and that's going to be out there, but also with, the, with us getting the e-books for free, I prefer to read ebooks. By the time the whole series is out, um, you know they've got you know however many people ready to review those books straight like that, and they're the true fans who have already read it, and they're all 
excited about it and the reviews are going to come up straight away, um, it's going to be, you know, it's good. It's going to be good for them. It's a good way of doing advanced reader copies, but getting money out of it, I guess. Yeah. So, the, so no, nothing's going live, right, mm -hmm. until they actually release the entire season. Is that right? I think yeah. I think okay. once the finale comes out, that's when the print book and the the full ebook comes out. Is that right? Oh. Um, the sure. Realm Keepers. The Realm. He's already yeah. got the print book in his hands. Yeah, but, but think, he. Uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Just, go ahead. I'm sorry, John. What do you know? I know he's gonna start. He's gonna start shipping the print books to people in September. I thought that it was going to be concurrent with whenever episode one was released. He was going to send out the I think print so. editions. Mm, okay. But either way, it's a, it's a great idea. Them. Right. Well, yeah, it took, it took all of us. He got sales from, uh, I don't know, I know Wade and Chrissy Bob. I don't know if John did or not, um, but, um, you know, I, I don't read... I don't read paperback books at all, but I do like collecting certain books and certain authors and series, but I will generally always read the ebook. But then when that happens now, I generally have to buy both books, especially from traditionally published authors, um, mm -hmm. because I want the I want the hardcover if I've been collecting a series, but I don't want to read the hardcover. I want to read the ebook, so they're getting twice the money off me, whereas with Garrett and Zach, um, they're giving me the ebook, mm -hmm. which is huge for me. Because I want the, I wanted the paperback. I think it's a really nice cover, um, but I wouldn't probably read that book as a book. There was actually a bookstore in I think it was in England not so long ago that they they started giving free ebooks to anybody who bought a came into the store and bought a physical book, and their sales went through the roof for that short time span that they did that. And I think if they would do that, they would actually increase, you know, if traditional publishers or even Amazon would make that available to people because you're not really losing sales by people buying the physical book and getting a free ebook. An ebook is just data on a screen. It, it wouldn't cost them anything to give a free one to the person who's bought a physical book. It would be a great marketing thing, but they won't do it because they still have that old idea that you should buy for every single little piece of information that you get, and you should rebuy it if you switch it to a new product. And what you're saying is true in the fact that they would probably end up making more money because people might be more likely to pay for the higher priced paperback and the ebooks always going to be, even though their ebooks tend to be more expensive, they're probably going to end up making more money in the long run. But John, do you have anything to add to this? Eh, who knows? Um, I mean, yeah, traditional publishing, they do want to preserve their print uh, business model because that's what they exist for. But, you know, I, I've never bought into the idea that they're willing to, you know, sacrifice money on the table um, just to spite, you know, the e-readers and stuff like that. I think there might be some truth to it, but I, I, I don't know. I just can't get over the fact that there's somebody in that company who whose job is to monitor sales and to take care of things like that. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm naive, but I know in my personal you know stuff that I would keep track of things like that, and I would try, and I would, you know, earlier what I was saying about keeping records, you know, those guys, they do that. And, you know, I think the the problem with it is, you know, they have such massive bureaucracies. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you you have publishers buying other publishers now. And, um, it takes a lot of, you know, hoops you have to jump through to get anything done. And I'm sure that, you know, working in those environments is just like any other job. You try and try, but eventually you get tired and, eh, who cares? But um, I don't know. Um, there may be merit to the idea, there may not be. It doesn't really affect us as self-publishers other than um, giving us an opportunity that we can exploit. And um, it's something that each of us should look into doing um, as we can to build our own readers and customer base. Cool. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, shall we move on to the subject adaptations? Does anyone want to talk about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have one thing to say. They missed the biggest, hugest failure in adaptations that I've ever seen, video games. Every oh, yeah. video game adaptation to any book that I've ever seen has been a complete, utter, horrible failure, except for a couple of the Batman ones. The and Batman the, ones. There's two Batman ones that I can think Arkham of. Arkham Asylum. suck. Yeah. The reason the I don't want to talk terrible. about it is... The reason I don't want to talk about it is, you know, if we're self-publishing roundtable, you're talking about 1% of all self-publishers in history who have to worry about adaptations of their work. And <laughs> none of us are anywhere close to that being a concern. So. No, I agree. I don't know. Um, Adaptation, I mean, adaptations isn't just movies and TV. It's also podcasts or audiobooks or um, artwork. Lexi's trying something new with the videos for, that are she's pairing with her stories. Uh, adaptations can be part of this the self-publishing world is if we want to innovate. Sure, they can be, but um, are any of us pursuing that right now? No, not really. No. Well, we are on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not devoted to our work. So. No, no that's, that's a good point, John. Um, I just, yeah, from that, the only thing I wanted to say about adaptations was two that I thought really, really worked well were um, the Lord of the Rings books with Peter Jackson, but he, he did a hell of a lot of work of me. I think he made them better. The, the books, I enjoyed the first couple of times I read them, but there's a lot of extra stuff in there. And George R. R. Martin's A Game of Thrones, I think, is a perfect example of an extremely successful and good adaptation of the books, keeping close to it, but apart from that, most of them are terrible. Yeah, I just all I gotta say from is I, I hope somebody wants to add, do an adaptation of my work someday. That's <laughs> I'm kind of like with John. We there. all have that. Right. Yeah. Okay, shall we uh, move on to our main subject uh, today? Uh, talking about basically what type length of books and type of books should self-published authors be considering and looking at putting out? And uh, I'll put it over to John to start off with that. Okay. Well, I talk to a lot of self-publishers on a daily basis, and um, one question that almost every single one of them is struggling with to one degree or another is, how long should my book be? Um, should we be writing full-length novels? Should we be writing novellas? Should we be writing short stories? Or serializing novella-length fiction? And you can find strong arguments for any approach you want to take. Um, there is a lot of validity, I believe, to the idea of publishing a full-length novel. Um, some of the people that I've connected with are very successful um, authors who self-publish their books, and they, they do it full-time now, and they do quite well doing it. And all of those guys um, unanimously say write full-length novels. Sean and um, David and now Johnny are writing novella length stories that they're serializing. Um, and, you know, Sean and David, they've been successful enough with it to where they're able to support their families doing that now. But they, like, almost kill themselves because I mean, they're having to put out 20, 28,000 words a week. Um, I think they're ahead of the curve now, but, you know, that's a. It was. It's taken them almost two years to get to this point. And that was two years where every single day they're cranking out 10,000 words or, you know, multiple thousands of words in a day. Um, if you're going to serialize fiction, I think that you do have to take that approach. You have to jump to it without reservation and fully commit to it because you're attracting the kind of reader who is going to devour your book and come back the next week and expect the next title to be ready for them so they can continue their story. Um, novellas, um, you can make the case that you Howie released a series of novellas and collected them into an omnibus, and he's the poster child for doing that successfully. Um, 
you also have several classic stories that were novellas and have gone on to become, you know, standards of the genre. And, you know, Asimov has several uh, novella stories that were compiled into novels. Um, the Foundation series is like that. Um, a bunch of different books. Um, but what should self-publishers do? Which approach makes sense for them? If you're sitting there and, you know, you're hoping to one day be able to support yourself by, by your writing, which approach makes the most sense? And um, I want to throw it out to you guys. What do you think? What approaches are you taking? Chrissy, I think um, it would be good for you to talk about because you've done a lot of flash fiction and short stories. Um, whenever anybody asks me how long should a story be, I tell them start writing and when the story is finished, that's how long the story should be because I have a 500 word story and I have an 80,000 word story. It really, if you just, if you want to tell the story, the story is going to, you know, tell you how long it's going to be. You can try shoehorning it into a specific size or, or feel like it should, you, that you need to, um, short stories or long stories or whatever, but the story is going to tell you how long it needs to be. I mean, even, like Sean and Dave, or Sean and Johnny, they did their, their Unicorn Western series and they ended up having to split it. I think they split one into two different ones because it ended up being much longer than they thought it would be and they wanted to keep going book by book. If that's what you need to do, then that's what you need to do. But like I said, the story is going to tell you how long it needs to be. Yeah, I'll, I'll tackle this a little bit from the from a reader perspective because of before I was a writer, I've always been a reader, and when I like read like Fat Vampire and and, and White Space and those things, um, loved them, you know, totally endorsed them, tell people to buy them. But as a reader, I was I had a hard time getting comfortable with it. I guess um, I'm so used to novels, so used to reading novels. Um, all my, you know, favorite books of all time are novels. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's it, self-publishing and e-readers expose me to things that I wouldn't have been reading normally. Normally, I would be going to the library or going to Barnes and Noble and buying full-length novels and that sort of thing. Um, so, from a reader standpoint, when I tend to search, I look for full-length novels. Also, if I'm going to spend my money, that's probably what I'm going to buy with, you know, recommendation and all that stuff. So from that standpoint, that's what I think of as a reader. But as a writer, um, I'm kind of in Chrissy's camp. There's sometimes I write things and I write a little short and I think, oh, this is really cool. Maybe, I, you know, I'd like, like to have people read this and not just maybe give it to them or whatever. Maybe I could, but, um, or I'm neck deep in two stories right now that I'm pretty sure are going to be full length novel stories. So um, it, it's definitely a different animal. and. And how you like to go about it. I know, you know, with Sean and Dave, when they started off, they, they said they're very big fans of television. They loved television growing up as a kid, that sort of thing. And so that's what they were drawn to. And so that's what they like to write. Maybe that would be good mm -hmm. advice to people. Write what you like to write because it will show and, and people will buy, hopefully, stuff you like to write if it's any good. So, um, but I, I think e-reading has changed the game a lot. And so... Um, and I don't know if there is a correct answer. That's one of the theme on the email loops. I said, I don't know if you can really say, anybody can say what's the right length because it just depends so much. But. Okay. Well, well, I do think that um, I think that e-readers have um, really changed the length that readers are willing to accept. Um, I think that you have a lot of people who are buying novella length fiction without realizing that they're buying novella-length fiction, whereas if they were standing in a bookstore and looking at something and saying, oh, that's only 90 pages, I'm not going to buy that. I'm going to get this 600-page book over here. Um, but with um, e-books, it's more difficult to tell. And Amazon has recently started listing their approximate page count, but I'm not sure how many readers are actually looking to see that number. I do think that authors have an obligation to... Um, try to inform people in their product description that, hey, this is a 80,000 word story or this is a 3,000 word story. Um, because, you know, you want to, you want people to make informed decisions whenever they're buying your books. 
but I do believe that um, the rise of the e-reader is changing and having an effect on the length of the fiction that we're reading and consuming. Because um, aside from e-readers, actual dedicated e-readers, a lot of people read on their cell phones, and um, you know they're me they're waiting for a meeting to start or something, so they'll sit down and read on their cell phone. And people like that, I believe, uh, do enjoy shorter books because they can knock one out during their lunch break or what have you. Um, so, I mean, I think there is a market for that. Yeah, um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this from first to reader and then what I'm doing writing. Um, from a reading point of view, I've always loved short fiction. I've, I've read it a lot. I used to get magazines with sci-fi short stories. I've read and collected a heap of old sci-fi magazines going right back for decades, and I and I love I love short stories, but it's always been difficult for me to get access to those stories because, as what John was saying, you couldn't walk into a bookstore and there'd be a hell of a lot for me to pick up. I mean, there's been some really successful traditional authors who have had short story collections and novellas and stuff out. George R. R. Martin was exceedingly popular in the 70s. Um, writing short stories and novellas and he won a number of awards. I think he's won three Hugo Awards. He's won a bunch of other awards. But he didn't make any money from doing it. He didn't get popular and um, to the level that he is now and he didn't you know, become wealthy like he does now until he wrote epic fantasy books, massive big series in Game of Thrones and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Stephen King and Philip K. Dick and those guys have done a lot of that sort of stuff, and I and I love reading that stuff. So I'm drawn to that as a reader, and I really love that because of ebooks and the way it's gone, that I now have access to a lot more of those stories, and that that's why I'm drawn to it as a writer because that's what I've spend a long time reading and seeking. Um, so I am writing, I've written a serial and I've written several novellas um, and I've written uh, quite a few flash fiction stories and short stories but I have, or, uh, I do have intention to write full novels and I think that's probably what will be more commercial and successful for me eventually, well I hope anyway. And I agree with what John was saying at the beginning, that novels are probably going to be the best bit. If you look at most of the reasonably successful self-published authors that are um, uh, above mid-list or mid-list or making a full living out of it, they are probably, a, I would say at least 90% of them are writing full-length novels. And most of those are the kind of romance novel-based people in the YA bunch of people, and those books are going to be longer. It is tougher, I guess, to sell a bunch of short stories and make money off of it for a couple of reasons. First, readers just aren't used to that yet as a medium, and two, Amazon the way that their Amazon the way that their pricing structure is work, you're not going to make a lot of money off of those. But the way that I'm designing it is that I think that I can use those short stories and those flash fiction, and I think Chris is doing the same thing to give a bite of who I am as a, as a writer, what my worlds are going to look like, and then turn those short stories and flashbacks into much larger works that hopefully then will become, you know, my sales. Um, yeah, like, like I'm Chris quite happy to give away. So, so I'm, no. I'm quite happy to give away, you know, a 2,000 word flash fiction story that it took me 45 minutes to write. Um, I'm much less likely to want to give away a 70,000 book that I spent six months writing. Um, so for me, it's you know an easy, an easy way, and it's a good, it's, it's a good way for me to get the story down. Quite often, I will if I have an idea and I think it might be a longer piece of work, I'll write it as a flash fiction or a short story first, just to see how the, the story plays out, and it might not ever become anything more than that. But I think it's a, I think it's a good practice for writers. It's really hard to write a story under, you know, five thousand words or two thousand or five hundred words. It's a whole complete story, and it's tough. Like it's really tough. And my 500-word story is, like, the one everybody says is the best. So, who knows? Right. Yeah, give, right. Them what they, give them what they like, right? That's what Hugh Howey did, right? He, he wrote mm -hmm. Wool, and then, and then they really liked it, so then he gave more of that. So there's, there's, a, there's a good argument for that, given smaller works to see what people really dig into. I, I think the packaging deal it needs to be something we could 
kind of throw around like what Chrissy was talking about, taking her four short stories, putting them to, all together in one book. Um, I don't, you mentioned Stephen King, Carl. I remember Four Past Midnight. I don't know if you guys but great stories in there. And, you know, and here it is. looks like a full-length novel. It's four short stories. Um, maybe just it's the packaging deal. You know, when we talk about Amazon pricing and, and all those things, maybe you write shorter pieces, but we put them together. We package them. We do, you know, we do different things with them in order to get the word count and then sell at two ninety nine or three ninety nine or whatever. The great well, model. The great model was serialized as well. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Originally, he has another one out just recently that it, he has um, serialized it as one hundred page books, and then you can get all of them together later. I don't know what it's called though. It's just a, a recent one. Hmm. I missed that. Do you have anything else to say, John? Well, I think the other thing that self publishers need to consider is. Um, is approaching this with a long-term goal of having a career as a writer. Um, just because you start off writing short stories or novellas doesn't necessarily mean you have to stick with that the rest of your life. And if you're a new writer, maybe it makes more sense for you to focus on short stories or novella-length fiction and make your mistakes in that form, you know, learn your lessons as best you can um, before you devote an entire year of your life to writing a hundred thousand word novel because <clears throat> there are lessons that you can learn from writing uh, novellas or what have you even though writing a novel is a different you know that exercises a different set of muscles there's still lessons that you can carry over um, from your shorter works and I think that that's there's some validity to that idea of you know hey I'm gonna you know pump out a bunch of novellas this year and then um, I'll uh, switch over and release a novel or whatever you want to do. But um, I think there's that's worth considering as well. Yeah. Just write. <laughs> write, 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 and write some more and then put stuff out. Sorry, I was reading the YouTube comments. <laughs> I didn't realize that <laughs> David writes on there. Hey, David. <laughs> Live viewer, yahoo! <laughs> um, yeah, so are, I think. Sorry, John, go on. Are all of you familiar with Dean Wesley Smith? Have you read his blog posts about um, I have. short fiction, that sort of thing? Yeah. For anyone who isn't viewing, or who is viewing that hasn't read that, um, Dean Wesley Smith's written, written several posts about making a living from short fiction. And basically, the idea is, regardless of how long your piece is, you um, price it at, at least two ninety nine. That you um, release them as individual stories after submitting them to professional markets, and because um, you want to try to get your professional sales um, first, then you you know, wait until that terms of that contract are over, release it on Amazon or wherever you want to self-publish, then. Um, when you have five titles, you bundle them together and sell them as an omnibus or a collection. And um, but just do a search for Dean Wesley Smith and um, how to make a living writing short fiction. And he did, he updates it every year, so you'll you'll see several posts. Yeah, I just I just read the latest one too, John. It's, he's got some good stuff. I I find him he's. He's pretty prescriptive. I mean, he, he and he's cut and dry, which I kind of like too. He's like, you know, if you, you, this is what you got to do, and you got to work your ass off, and and all those things. He doesn't sugarcoat anything, but uh, I I do like some of that stuff. Maybe we can put that in the show notes, Carl. Make it work for you, but <laughs> David um, David Wright made a comment saying that's what Sean and I do with our Dark Crossing collections. So they they do the same thing. They put them together and they bundle those short stories together. And honestly, the I love the the uh, Dark Crossings collections they release because um, I I've bought both those collections and read them and um, those are some of the best stories that they've released in my opinion. Yeah, you get more depth and stuff from the other books from their actual serials, but they they've got a few pieces in those Dark Crossings where it just like makes you stop and think. Um, 
I think David wrote one called um, Monsters that to this day is still one of my favorite things that they've written. And um, I also I really like the author's notes at the end of each of those stories where they explain why they wrote the story, what the genesis for the idea was, and all that stuff. I like the behind the scenes material that they give you in those books. Yeah, I really liked both the Dark Crossings as well. And um, Philip K. Dick is one of my favorite um, science fiction authors ever, and a majority of his stuff is dual fiction. Um, most, you know, there's been a hell of a lot of adaptations of movies based on really, really short stories, which when you watch the movie, you know, and some, some of those have been terrible and some of them have been good. Um, you kind of, you know, that little idea, um, you know, can, can definitely become something bigger. But I really like that he was a short story, you know, writer mainly. He did some novella stuff as well. Um, and one of my favorite, and I really, really enjoy reading flash fiction, which is even shorter than short stories. You're talking, you know, a couple of thousand words. Um, I've written so much of those, and Chris has done a lot of those. Um, and one of my favorite pieces of flash fiction, one of my favorite stories that I still think about all the time, which I read a few weeks ago, was one of Chris's, which is Scarecrow, and that's like 500 words or something, isn't it? Which and it's a Scarecrow? whole story. That's the 500 word yeah, one. Yeah, 500 word story, and and that. You know, that story really is something that I think about a lot, and it's, you know, it, it drew me in in 500 words. Um, so I, I really like the shorter stuff. I'm really a skeptic about flash fiction. I'm, I've tried it, tried to read it. I've never tried writing it, but I just, I <laughs> have, have a ever, hard time. Have you ever read Ray Bradbury? Yes. Yeah, he's got lots of short stuff, yeah. Well, let Most, me get a lot of his stories are flash fictions. Yeah. Okay. Um, Blake Crouch wrote. I can't remember the name of it. Um, you can buy it for ninety nine cents. It has a picture of a hand reaching out of a jail cell, mm -hmm. and it's right around eleven hundred words, maybe. Um, and I guess that's flash fiction. I don't really know the definition of it that well, but it was very short. But that is one of the best short stories I've read. Um, I'll, I'll find the link to that, and I'll have Carl put it in the show notes. But um, <laughs> well, we're that, Carl. Yeah. it's a really good book or story. <clears throat> well, speaking of, um, sorry, Johnny, Karen. I was going to say, did you guys ever watch um, Tales from the Crypt? Yes. The yes, show? totally. You'll love that. that. Love that show, yeah. yes. <laughs> you know, that's, that show was something that really got me thinking about stories and stuff when I was growing up. And, you know, they were, like, quite often really, really short, you know, five, ten-minute little um, stories. And, and, and I consider that kind of a flash, flash fiction TV show. See, um, but the thing is that with the Blake Crouch story or even the Tales from the Crypt or the Ray Barnbury, that those stories, they had a punch to them. You know, um, when you read them, it, it hits you. It was a sledgehammer sent you there. They're making a good point. And the flash fiction I read where, you know, just people are posting it online, it's, I read it and I'm like, yeah, I'm glad you thought the leaf was pretty, but what's the point of this? You just wasted five <laughs> minutes of my time. You know, I don't want <laughs> to read that. <laughs> Give no, me I something. Agree. Yeah. You know. And that's bad, that's bad flash fiction. Okay, maybe I just mine. haven't been experienced or exposed to good flash fiction. I, I will send you my Scarecrow one. It is not about a pretty leaf. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, have you ever written the words pretty leaf in any of your stories, Chrissy? <laughs> yeah, I, I think once when I was like 14. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. The leaf was a metaphor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hey, look at it this way, John. At least you only wasted five minutes of your time with bad flash fiction versus hours with a bad book, right? I mean, so... Okay, do you finish a book? If, if you start reading a novel and you think it's terrible, do you finish it or do you just throw it away? I toss, but I know, I know someone really well that, that she cannot toss a book away. I don't know what it is about it, but she's, once she starts a book, she's committed to the end no matter what. I think it's... Yeah, I... It, Life's too short, too precious. Um, I always give it three chapters, though. I, that's kind of my set rule. I always give something three chapters. Yeah, that, that's reasonable. Yeah. I, 
I've actually thrown a book away because I, I thought it was so horrible that I couldn't wish it on anybody else. And so I couldn't even like take, I, I'm really big on giving books back to resell or something, anything. But this one was so bad that I just, I threw it in the trash can. <laughs> yeah. And this thing, somebody got that traditionally published, right? Somebody yes. actually sold that to somebody. <laughs> I don't understand that. I was, I've read things like that. And I'm like, I can write better than this. Why am I not writing? Yes. There you go. John, you go. did you have something to add to that? No, I'm done. I'm good. <laughs> okay, well, we've pretty much covered, I think, as much as we can about this. And I think the answer to the question that John raised at the beginning is there isn't really an answer. But <laughs> at least put some thought into what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah, and be organized. Track things. That's what that's what I got from John. <laughs> and the market is and the market is changing like every day. So you know you might see something that's not doing that well now is potentially in six months going to be the hottest thing going. So. So thank you for turning into this very special John episode of Self Publishing Roundtable. <laughs> We're gonna name it well, that just for yeah, you. Just for you, yeah, that's right. <laughs> we haven't we haven't had Bill here to you know say anything either, so we've missed Bill. Yeah, and, <laughs> and let's, let's be real, Carl. You haven't been totally up to snuff tonight. Uh, I won't necessarily mention why, but <laughs> talking about unicorns or something. Sure, we don't want to mention why. <laughs> we could turn this into I the books and beer I'm... podcast. <laughs> Uh, I can't drink any more beer, unfortunately, because I, yeah, I'm not feeling particularly well. I had my books and beer last night. <laughs> and more beer. And more beer. And more beer. And more beer. <laughs> While we're talking about books and beer, um, I just wanted to mention that I started watching um, uh, a podcast called Books and Beer um, with Evo Terra, and um, I came across it from John. Um, who was um, one of the members of the last, was it the last episode? Yes. John? I yes, watched sir. that um, and, and I came across it solely through the fact that John was on there and I think it was the third time you've been on. Um, and I went back and watched half a dozen of the episodes and I will go back and watch more. But um, if anyone's watching, I think you should check it out. It's a really cool show. Maybe John could tell us a bit more about it. Sure. Um, each week, Evo Terra and Jeff Moriarty, they run a... Um, video podcast through Google Hangouts called Books and Beer. It's 15 minutes long. They begin each episode by um, telling the audience what type of beer they're drinking that night, then ask the guests what type they're drinking. Um, it's awkward for me because I don't drink, so uh, every time I'm like, I got this or whatever. But um, and then they discuss a topic. After the 15 minutes are up, they open their the podcast up to anybody who wants to join and you have different people from Google Plus communities or whatever who will join in the podcast and you can actually talk to the guests for another 15 minutes. But it's a really good show. Um, it, Evo does a good job selecting guests and topics um, that are informative and entertaining. Um, they also run a, um, I guess it's a company called ePublish Unum. And they do seminars and um, they're releasing a series of um, books for indie authors. Um, he has one about writing blurbs and um, product descriptions, and he's getting ready to release another one um, uh, anytime now. <clears throat> so, is the, I think their um, podcast is, the, is booksandbeer.com. Yeah, he's the patio books guy, right? Yeah, Evo is the guy who started patio books. Yeah. Yeah, I heard, heard of them first through uh, SPP, so. Yeah, good stuff. Definitely good stuff. Yeah, so I've been show. I've been watching books and beers since the day they were on self or Eva was on self publishing podcast. So, and I'm surprised I don't remember seeing John on any of the episodes. I feel like I should go back and watch them again. <laughs> um, the first one that I was in was the very first podcast I'd ever been on anywhere. So you oh. see a lot of very stiff images of me trying to look um, <laughs> like I know what I'm talking about. Well, you've come a long ways, John, since then, really. <laughs> I've just gotten comfortable with the idea that I don't look don't look like I know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> I've 
kind of, kind of come to the conclusion that nobody knows what the heck they're talking about. We just pretend. Yeah. Yeah. So If you can sell it well, that's all that matters. That's right. <laughs> We're all giving well, out snake oil, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> We're all a bunch of hacks making it up there as we go along. <laughs> okay, let's well, end this thing, uh, people. Uh, <laughs> on that, i <up>, you know. <laughs> Does anyone... Uh, take us take away, Carl. <laughs> Chrissy, you got anything you want to say before you go? Anything coming out this week that you want people to read? I am hoping to have the camera out by the end of tomorrow. And what's the camera? The camera five is, seconds. it is the sequel to The Ring. It's about a camera that takes, um, captures images and captures creatures in, it, in the pictures. And after the camera's release, look for her new title, The Pretty Leaf. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know what? I'm going to write one just for you. Just, Do just it. because of that. Okay. Do it. <laughs> Good one, John. <laughs> <laughs> John, any any books? How's your writing going? Anything you want to talk about? Um, I've got, I finished novella length story, and um, actually, I'm trying to decide whether I should go ahead and publish that or go ahead and make it into a full length novel. So I'll flip a coin and make a decision. Um, I don't have anything to promote. Just visit my website, see my podcast if you want. If you don't, that's fine too. Talk to John about Google Plus. He's yeah. yeah, he's the master on Google+. Plus. Yes. Um, I guess that leaves me. Yeah, um, I don't have anything necessarily released right now, but if, if I get a few more people to sign up on my email list, I'll give them a free short story. So visit me at wadefinnegan.com and sign up. Release quick, painless, easy, and I'll you'll get a free short story. What the heck? So but that's it for me. Okay, and I'm... Um about a week and a half away from putting out the first episode of the serial that I was talking about before and I've just been writing some flash fiction that I'm going to put out as a collection which some people have read some of them and some people haven't so we'll see how that goes um, apart from that I don't have anything else to add um, so let's finish this before we waste any more of anyone else's time um, thanks again for listening to the third episode and we'll see you guys next week All right, guys Right. Good night.